So we have the marvellous David Campbell. Um, I think everybody knows me. I'm Amy Douglas. We have no Jimmy Williamson. Uh, Jimmy was meant to be joining us tonight and we were going to be, I was going to be having a chat and a, a talk with Jimmy Williamson, one of Duncan's sons tonight. Sadly, he can't be with us tonight. Um, and David has jumped in at the last moment. This is his first time on Zoom. So we've just been getting everything a little bit sorted. Hope you're getting David settled. And it's a brave thing to come straight into this, having never done Zoom before. So for those of you who don't know who David Campbell is, Oh, David, you're sort of the, you're the king of storytelling in Edinburgh, really. Um, the, the flat that David lives in is the place where all storytellers eventually end up. Um, I first met David there in that flat with, with Duncan, and it's a meeting place, a Cayley place, and... David is this subtle guide and teacher who always has stories and is already always willing to welcome um, a storyteller into to Edinburgh. And I, I don't I don't know what storytelling would be like in Edinburgh without you, to be honest, David. But but how are you coping? Because your house is normally such a sociable place. How are you coping with isolation in the middle of the city? Well, uh, one or two things. Uh, at the moment, I'm writing my memoirs in the mornings and I'm very lucky because I've got Pepe who's a Spaniard here and he is uh, christened the CHE, the chief heating engineer, because he understands how wireless works and how the heating can be done automatically. And I've got Sabrina who's uh, Italian and she usually is working in a tour company but she can't so she is helping me. So these two are helping me. Otherwise a I do get out, there's a little wee park up the road, a eh, hundred yards, and uh, so I have a key to that park. It's one of these private Edinburgh things, but anyhow, it's very handy. So that's one thing. And then I was reminded of a program I saw, a, or I heard a long time ago, by some Glasgow a, lads, and they said, um, and this is my life as well at the moment. I've never been so busy. I've never been so busy. I get up in the morning and then I've got to have my shower. So I go and have my shower and I make sure I'm very well washed and cleaned for many reasons. Also possibly I'm thinking about that invisible little thing that's creeping around us everywhere these days. So I'm spotless when I get out the shower and then having washed and uh, dried, I go and I make my porridge. And of course, every morning I make the porridge very, very beautiful and I put some fruit in it and it becomes a kind of royal porridge. So that's what I do then. And then I go to do a little bit of work of making my memoirs and basically every minute of the day is so full, I've never been so busy. So there you go. And then in the evenings, um, Pepe has a, a recording of the, the jungle book that he's wanting us to hear and sometimes I tell them a joke and just the um, one <laughs> joke, right? just the one joke well no not really and um, so I love jokes of course as Duncan did I, I mean Duncan would um, phone up and his sole purpose in phoning would be to tell me a joke and equally when I got a new joke, my sole purpose would be to tell him a joke. And then, of course, the next time I met him, I would hear a joke and I'd think, what is this? Because his beginning would be so totally labyrinthine that uh, you wouldn't recognize it for a while. But anyhow, I'm keeping myself um, happily busy, so I'm not uh, wearying at this time at all. I'm missing Katrina because she's a nurse and um, she is being very careful not mm. to um, implicate me in any of the dangers so I don't really see her which is a little bit sad. Well it's sad but I think it's a wise decision. Yeah, exactly. So well now now you've mastered Zoom you'll be able yes. to talk to her on Zoom. Yes exactly well actually I did talk to a friend of mine not on Zoom but on um, FaceTime which is the um, Apple thing. There's a thing called FaceTime. 
It's a, yeah, it's pretty similar. So tonight, um, the, I've started doing these because it, it's because of coronavirus, really, that I've started doing these talk shows because originally I was going to be doing podcasts about about Duncan. Um, I'm lucky enough that I got some Arts Council funding to, to digitise Duncan's tapes and to listen to them, but also to to talk to various people about Duncan and and who he was and why he's important because obviously Duncan died sort of 12 years ago now, it's gone so fast it, um, and he still seems very present, but there's a lot of people who never met him, who don't really know what I'm talking about when I talk about Duncan. So I suppose I'm, I'm talking to different people. So we get all of these different views and different perspectives and faces of him so that people get an idea of the man that he really was. And obviously you knew Duncan for a lot longer than me. And I mean, you're writing your memoirs now, but you wrote um, a book, A Traveller in Two Worlds, um, about Duncan really, uh, an autobiography of part of his life. But how, how did you meet him? <laughs> Well, I met him because I was a, just leaving the BBC and um, I was doing a programme for 12-year-olds um, and a, a friend of mine I met in the pub, usual place, uh, for uh, any useful conversations. And this per person said, oh, you should meet Duncan Williamson. And uh, he recommended to me a book and a, it was a, it contained the story, Mary and the Seal. And uh, so a, this person had spoken, so it, he was actually um, the illustrator of that book a, that I met and he said, uh, you should meet Duncan Williamson. So I thought, well, for my program, I'll go and uh, record Duncan Williamson. So I read the story and I phoned the publisher, Stephanie Wolf Murray, and said, I'd like to record Duncan Williamson and his story, a Mary and the Seal. And uh, I said, a, but I think it's slightly long. I may have to cut it. But she said, well, <laughs> a, so, so, so she phoned me back and said, you can't use it. I said, why not? She said, Duncan Williamson says, that the story is that length and no other length. So I said, oh, well, I think I'll go and see Duncan Williamson. So I had an old van at the time and he was living in Lizzie Wells in Fife with uh, Linda and the two kids. And uh, they were about what height? I think they were about, Betsy was about nine maybe and Tommy uh, seven. And uh, so I rolled up in the van and uh, into the yard at Lizzie Wells, and uh, Duncan was standing at the door, honestly, like John Wayne, you know, everything except the two guns by his side. And he said, yes, who are you? I said, I'm David Campbell, BBC. I said, yes. He said, as he said you want to record my, my uh, story? I said, yes. He said, you think it's too long? I said, well, I think it's an incredibly beautiful story. I don't think the story is too long, but my program is only a certain length. And so maybe it's the program that's too short, but I can't make it any longer. And he looked at me, said nothing, threw his arms around me and said, David Campbell, you and me are going to be the best of friends. Come in, I said, wait a minute. And I went out to the van. <laughs> And uh, I brought in a bottle of Glenfiddich. And uh, so that was our first meeting, uh, the first Cayley, because of course, Linda joined us and um, Duncan was uh, in fine fettle, even better fettle after a dram or two of malt whiskey. And um, I remember him, uh, I do remember him singing a, a the song that he wrote about, not Adam McNaughton's version of Yellow and the Broom, but the one that he wrote, which was, Come sit beside me, Peggy, dear. I hate to see a gloom 
and I will take you from this place when the yellow is on the broom. I'll sing one more verse. When the, well, that's, I'll just sing that verse. <laughs> Yes, yes. Sang this love song. beautiful. Yeah, and yeah, I mean, it's a beautiful song, his song. Yeah. And the yellow is on the broom. Yes, I will take you from this place when the yellow is on the broom. By Loch Leven's bunny side and by the river spee, I will pearl fish my love and on my pipes I'll play. So put a smile upon your face. I hate to see you gloom. And I will take you from this place when the yellow, yellow is on the broom. Yeah, great. <laughs> and, a, and of course, there are many, many tales and all the rest of it. And um, I probably unwisely drove home that night. But anyhow, he agreed that he would that record the, the the story, if we could get an audience of children, and he got the local school, because as you know, he was just the wizard, the magic man with, with children. And so, um, and, uh, you know, and that was the beginning of my kind of education um, with Duncan, because uh, even then, he was spending so much time before he began, I was thinking, why is he doing this? But he was saying hello, getting to know them, letting them get to know him. You know, this sort of, without which not, the sine qua non for a storytelling connection. And then when he recorded it, it was too short. And so he said, oh, never mind, David, I will fill it in. And of course, out came the Jews harp. Wing, 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 wing. So we filled it in with the Jews harp. and. Uh, so that was how I, I got to know him. And um, then it wasn't long after that, I'd left the BBC and I'd been just, my Duncan program was just filling in really. And um, so he said, uh, well, David, you, I want you to come with me. So I used to go with him a, uh, on jaunts to schools, a, uh, and of course, I, I knew Mary in the Seal quite well. And then one day he simply said, no, uh, master storyteller from the BBC is going to tell you a story. You know how Duncan would always overstate your credentials. And uh, he said, David Campbell is going to tell you a story. And I thought, oh my Lord. So I told Mary in the Seal. And then of course, in his usual manners, he said, David Campbell, you told that story better than me. And of course, I mean, you know, Duncan. And uh, so that was how a, I began to know him. And then we traveled because I had left. So I hadn't, I hadn't realized that you weren't a storyteller before you met him. Well, not really. I you know I'd done lots of things. I'd been, um, uh, I'd, I'd directed endless a, um, actors and one thing or another, but I'd never, Actually, I mean, from being a kid, I loved telling stories and I loved poetry and all that, but I'd never actually been a storyteller before I met Duncan in 1987 or whenever it was. And then, and then from then on, I mean, what a golden apprenticeship, you see. Mm. It was to have Duncan, who was just, uh, as you know, well, the same for yourself, you know. Yeah, absolutely. Mm, yeah. So, but I mean, it's interesting, we're talking about telling Mary in the Seal. So one of the questions that we've just got on the question on the Q&A is, I mean, how, how did Duncan feel about folks sharing his stories is what Robert Suter said. Yeah, well, that's a fascinating question because it, it, Duncan was a unpredictable and you never knew exactly how he'd respond. But basically, 
he would say stories is a gift and it's for everybody and uh, he would give you give his stories away you know like a spendthrift but at some times I remember I can't remember who it was that turned one of his stories into a song and he just hated it <laughs> you know and if Duncan hated things you know it was white hot hatred <clears throat> burning and uh, you know really really um, so if he didn't like the way somebody was doing something he would say so but normally speaking his great thing was that the stories are a gift and you should give them away so that he could never really understand and nor do I the American ones who are just jealously guarding their stories and copywriting traditional stories and so on so because they and then I remember when Americans would visit him in Lizzie Wells or later on, they would be amazed at his open-handed generosity and said, yes, tell that story. And of course, that's the kind of philosophy I know you would have, Amy. It's the philosophy I have, and it is really the total philosophy in the whole of the ethos of the Scottish storytellers. Hmm. Yeah. Well, absolutely, but I can, um, he did occasionally hate things with a, with a hot hatred, but I mean, one of the things that he he said to me, and I was talking with Nick about this last week, was kind of, there's only three things you can't change about a story, Amy, and it's the beginning, the middle, and the end. Mm -hmm. And it's that thing, if you can tell a story in your own words, but it needs to come from your heart. And if you change the heart of the story, and if you if you take something that is really magical and and has a meaning for the person who's telling it and kind of make it into a joke or a silly ditty it's i can i can understand why that would be something that he would hate yeah. and i know that some people did that and you could kind of listen to the version and go i think you've really missed the point <laughs> but if you listened and i mean he did have a thing of really um you would see somebody and say this is the story for you. I am going to tell you this story and this is the story you have to take and you have to tell. And he would normally see some, something in that person that that was a story that was going to resonate with them, that would mean something to them and that he knew that that story would be safe with, with them and that they would cherish it. And I think that was one of the things that he did that was great rather than trying to give everything to just one, one person because there was so much. He would give them little cherries to people who would really just polish that one story and love it and take care of it and, and pass it on. Sure, sure, sure. And I think, uh, I think at certain times uh, in the latter days of the storytelling in Scotland, he was impatient with some people who, you know, wanted to gobble every story in the world and get serious indigestion, you know, because they, because I mean, he really, I mean, he used to say, you know, what makes a great storyteller to me and I would not, and then, and of course, his answer was three words: a good listener. Mm. And uh, you know, he, and the more you think about that, and the more I've thought about it, the more profound and extraordinary it is. If you're listening with everything, you know, to what you're doing, what the audience is doing, what the story is doing, you know, then you become that kind of storyteller that Duncan would, you know, want to listen to. I mean, he could be. <laughs> I've sat on the stage with Duncan, listening to storyteller on the stage, and after a wee while I've seen him peering at his watch, and then a wee while later, <laughs> peering at his watch again, <laughs> when is this person going to stop, <laughs> you know? I mean, yeah, I've seen him actually get off the stage, yeah. walk to the exit, light up a cigarette, Put his head into the, the tent every now and then. No, they're still going. <laughs> the most dramatic sigh. Yeah. <sighs> I know. Eventually come back up. <laughs> I know. No, that you were in no doubt whatsoever. But equally, you know, if you, I mean, I've seen him, I remember, I can't remember what, where it was I was telling this story. I think it was the minister and the skull. And afterwards, you know, uh, I'd been telling that story. And he said, David, that was beautiful. That was wonderful. That was the best I ever heard that story. You know, he was very, very generous and fulsome and encouraging if he thought you did a thing well. Really what, what is, I don't, I don't, not sure I know that story. 
about the the minister and the skull. Really? Well, it's um. Well, I, I won't tell the whole of the story, but they, basically, there was in this Highland Glen an old minister, and he was very, very much loved, and um, he would go through the snows and to the far corners of the glen, everywhere he would go. And of course, where he'd arrive, he'd get the best of Highland hospitality. He would get probably uh, bannocks and then he would have cups of tea. And then there would be the uskery, the whiskey, and there would be the stories of the songs and so forth. And uh, the, all the news of the district. And anyhow, one occasion, the storyteller in the winter I had stayed rather late, and in the morning he was found like just a statue in the snow with his with his crummock looking as if to the heavens. And the local people said, Oh, you are so beautiful, so beautiful, standing there as if the angels had taken him already. Anyhow, he was a he was succeeded by an ambitious and uh, a young minister from the lowlands, from Edinburgh probably, and um, his uh, manner was uh, totally different, and, uh, but his tradition, and his tradition was, you know, hellfire and sin and damnation and all the rest of it. So he was a fierce fire brimming kind of minister. And uh, he would spend hours poring over the Bible, particularly his favorite books like Job, full of the tortures and torments of that poor prophet. And um, then he would get ready his sermon for the next day. And he, when he had, um, one night he was thinking deeply and wondering, it was a beautiful moonlit night and he went into the graveyard for his, um, for his inspiration. And in the graveyard, uh, there was, um, a mausoleum at the far end of the graveyard. And he looked into that mausoleum and um, there was a skull, a beautiful white human skull. And it seemed to be almost smiling at the white, white teeth glittering in the moonlight. And uh, the minister, you know, despite being a minister, a man of the cloth, was kind of rather vain. And he was particularly, um, proud of his own teeth and his wonderful smile. And uh, so as he was gazing at this uh, uh, skull, the, the skull suddenly said to him, you like my teeth? And of course the minister was stunned and shocked. He said, yes, I, I was admiring your teeth. And the skull said, you've got very nice teeth yourself. He said, oh, thank you. So anyhow, this skull turned out to be a spectacular scholar of the Bible, a theologian of the real depth and, and erudition. And uh, the result is they got into fantastic uh, discussion. The minister had never been so happy in that village. The other people, you know, weren't really interested. And uh, so they talked and they talked and the minister said, well, I really must go, but You've given me so many ideas for tomorrow's sermon. I'd love to meet you again. And um, the skull said, I haven't, I haven't uh, you know, I haven't enjoyed a conversation like this for, for years and years and years, and which you could well believe anyhow. So the minister said, well, I'd love to um, talk again. The skull said, well, why don't I roll down and see you? And the minister said, well, that would be a privilege. So they arranged that the next uh, month, Sunday, after uh, the sermon and all the rest of it, he would um, roll along to see the minister. And um, I hope this story is not taking too long for you. No, time. no, no, keep going. <laughs> so, <clears throat> so the next um, day, the minister was full of anticipation and thinking, three o'clock and watching the clock, the skull will be along and he's thinking this will be just a wonderful conversation. And he was looking out and he said to his housekeeper, do you, do you see uh, anything, uh, someone, any, anything coming? And she said, well, 
see something like a turnip rolling down the road. He said, open the door. And so in rolled the skull. And <laughs> so the minister um, put the skull handily um, by the table and uh, he said, uh, I'm just going to have a cup of tea. And the skull said, well, <laughs> I'm sorry, but I don't really have a stomach for it. But <laughs> it's nice to have the chat anyhow. So once more, they had the most wonderful, wonderful conversation. And it turned out the skull himself had been a man of the cloth. And uh, he said, um, he said, I tell you what, he said, why don't you come uh, to the place where I used to bide? I won't be in the mausoleum, but what you need to do is come through the graveyard, come to the mausoleum, and then take a path through the forest. And then I have to warn you, he said, you'll come to three very strange things to your eyes. He says, whatever you do, say nothing. And, uh, and uh, in time, you'll come to a little thatched cottage and um, you know, you, you, there's, there's a beautiful, there's a beautiful uh, elm tree outside. You'll know it's my cottage. He said, but say nothing, whatever happens to you. So uh, the minister thought, oh, fine. So he arranged that uh, the next week he would make that journey. And uh, so <coughs> they, 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 he took his horse and uh, went uh, through the old graveyard, through the mausoleum, and uh, through the, the forest. And then he came to a quarry. And in the quarry, there were two men, and they were stripped naked to the waist. And they were showering uh, earth and rubble and pebbles out of, the, out, of the, out of the quarry. And they were sweating, and they were grunting, and they were groaning. And they were obviously in pain. And the minister thought, dear me, oh dear. But he said nothing. He thought, oh well, I've been told to keep quiet. So he rode on. And after a while, he came to another house. And it was rather a grand house. And uh, so he, he thought, oh well, I'll, I'll, and, and when he got near, he heard this. <laughs> howling and screaming and he uh, and um, he thought what, what what is that and uh, so he thought what on earth is that and uh, so when he when he came he saw this woman and she was against a tree and this young woman had a birch rod she was battering her battering her battering her I just thought, dear, dear, he says, oh, what is that? And so he rode further on, and uh, as he rode further on, he came to a, a third, a third cottage. And uh, in this third cottage, there was a, a big fat woman, and uh, she was, had her head uplifted. And she was a look of intense agony on her face and into her mouth and coming out there were little rats and mice and the, oh, and just, oh, dear, he said. But he said nothing and he rode on. And at last he came to that elm tree and the cottage and he tethered his horse and uh, knocked on the door and he was feeling a bit shaken and there was a skull. And the skull said, come in, come in. Oh, he says, you're looking a bit shaken and pale. Are you all right? And the minister said, no, uh, no I'm, not, I'm not all right at all. Oh, said the skull, I know what it is. It's the three sights you've seen on your journey here. He said, yes, that's what it is. The skull said, look, there's a whiskey. Pour yourself a, a whiskey. I, I haven't really got the hands for it. So he poured himself an unusual thing, pretty stiff whiskey. And 
felt we were better. And um, the skull said, yes. He said, um, strange sights indeed, he said. You came across a quarry, did you not? He said, yes. He said, well, in my time, he said, I told you as a minister, and uh, there was in that parish, there were these two men. And uh, these were young men, and they uh, were blasphemers, and they would blaspheme the Sabbath, and they would also work every moment of the day in the Sabbath. And so the, um, the justice for them is that they will be like Sisyphus or forever taking, emptying that quarry. Oh, he said, that's terrible. Oh, he says, and he says, then he came across a, a, a young woman. He said, yes. He said, well, he said, the story of that was there was a young traveler woman and uh, she, um, she took uh, employment with uh, that very, very rich person. And that woman worked her day and night, starved her until, till she was a, till she was a, till she was a, oh no, she didn't, that's not what happened to that one. <laughs> that's, so uh, she, and she starved her and she beat her until that poor young girl died. And so this is the justice for that woman. She said, oh, that's, that's terrible. And so it went on to, and he said, and the third one you saw, that rather large woman, he says, yes, the, the, these mice are rats in and out of her mouth. He said, yes. Well, that was another poor lassie came to the door and she had a bairn to feed. And this woman knew very well that there had been a rat in the milk vat, and she gave that woman the rat, the milk infested by the rat, and so that is her punishment. Oh my gosh, he said, that is a terrible story. He said, well, how long do you think you've been here? He says, well, he says, uh, oh, maybe three, three, two or three hours. He said, no, no, a long time has passed. He said, when you leave this place, you get on your horse. He said, but take a, a piece of sackcloth you'll see out there and do not land on the ground without putting that sackcloth there before you land. And he says, as you go, you'll find many things have changed for many, many years have passed. So on your way and remember the sackcloth. So the minister got up and on he rode and above. He heard the strange, wild, roaring, great metal things flying across the sky, and then flashing by the lights of great, great vehicles on, on rails. And, and he came into what he thought was the town that everything was built up, and the boys and girls were laughing at him because he was in this old clothes. And, and then, he, he, then he, he came to this woman washing the steps, and, he says, excuse me, he says, I was told I, I, there was a minister around this place a, many years ago. She said, Do you know that minister? And she said, how many years ago? He said, I, I, I don't know. She said, there was a story about a minister. This minister was said to be mad. He said that he had uh, dined with a skull. And the minister said, that minister wasn't mad, that minister was me. Oh, no, she said he was mad. He said he was not mad and jumped off the horse. <laughs> Immediately, more or less turned into dust. But his skull rolled down a little hill and came to rest in a mausoleum beside another skull. And both of them have very, very beautiful teeth. Long time since I, uh, long time since I thought of that story. <laughs> <laughs> so, anyway. mm -hmm. A great story. Yeah. Um, I think uh, I heard a version of that from Willie McPhee, though. You know, Willie McPhee. Mm -hmm. The piper and storyteller. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Uh -huh. yeah, yeah. Big, big pal of Duncan's, although Duncan used to 
mock him, of course, furiously, but he was a very big pal and a great piper. Lo lovely man, yeah. Mm. I only got to meet him once and um, I traveled, it was my driving lesson. Uh, Duncan taught me to drive. Um, you know, the only man brave enough to do it. <laughs> um, my my parents couldn't quite believe that he'd, he'd taken that on. Um, but he woke me up one morning and said, right, Amy, we're going to Sky. You're driving. If you can't drive by the time we get back, you'll never learn. And so we drove to Sky. And one of the places that we stopped on Sky, we drove into this clearing. And I had heard many stories about Scottish midges. But until that day, I hadn't really believed them. And we oh. stopped the car and we could see Willie and Bella's caravan uh, on the other side of the clearing. And just before we opened the door, there was like a haze between us and the, and the caravan. And it got thicker and thicker and the, the sun vanished and the entire clearing went black. And we had to run from the car to the caravan and they opened the door, scooped us in and shut it and kind of just like patted us down with a towel to get rid of the midges. And it was just this enormous cloud of midges just descended. Um, it was it was crazy, but I, I still don't know quite how Duncan knew that they would be there because obviously Willa and Bella were, were, were traveling all the time. But um, I think it was just a clearing that they often did camp in. And that was the one time that I got to meet them and he got to play me a, a couple of tunes and a story. And he was a really great piper. I mean, his, um, his lungs were going by then, so he wasn't quite, he was struggling with the, the big tunes he was sort of playing on the chanter. Well, but, uh, I, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Well, he was a lovely, lovely man. Real, I mean, uh, Sheila, Sheila Douglas, I think, wrote a book of his stories. A, I think it's called Gentleman of the Road. He was really a gentleman and he had quite a hard life because he was also very, very strong and people would just want to call him out and fight and he could fight, but he didn't ever actually want to fight But you know, these macho men sort of wanted to fight, but uh, yeah, yeah. No, he used to, no, he was here a few times with, uh, with Bella. I loved Bella's face, it was like an autumn leaf. It was so beautiful, you know, an old wrinkled face. And they used to play the Jews harp together, you know, Bella and Willie. Yeah. Yeah. Great people. So did you did you meet them when you went travelling with Duncan? Because you were starting to say earlier and, and you, you did do a lot of travelling around with Duncan, didn't you? Yeah, I did. I, well, I did. I travelled the length and breadth of uh, Scotland up as far as the islands, Across, across the sky, well, well, very, yeah, far up and down Scotland. And, they, and then, of course, we traveled other places together, like Israel and the Netherlands and the States and so forth, you know. And so I traveled many places, yeah. And uh, it was always an adventure, of course. <laughs> was, was it in the van or did you go camping? They, no, no, we went in my uh, traveller van and that was purgatory because it was a Volkswagen. I mean, much of the time it was a great, but it was a Volkswagen and I slept above. And in the morning, I was in serious danger of suffocating from Duncan's incessant smoking. God, he would never stop smoking. But, uh, you know, <laughs> but anyhow, yeah, we travelled mostly in my van. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And what what was that like? Did he did he tell you the stories of of when he'd walked those places? Would he be guiding you, or were you normally working? Yeah. No, well, we would be. A, he would he would of course on the way tell a stories of a, where where they'd camped and a, tell little stories of a, you know where they made the fires and of course when we, when we went up to Furness where he was uh, born and where his uh, uh, grannies lived and all that sort of thing. He would, we'd go along the beach and we'd cook um, shellfish. And uh, so that was really interesting. And he'd make fires and, you know, he's really at home in that kind of place. But, uh, but I mean, Duncan was such a, I mean, 
an immediacy among them. When he, when he saw people, he immediately wanted to be with them and he had a great capacity to engage them, whether they're, you know, three feet tall or near the grave. He was just a genius at um, saying hello. And, um, you know, he could be, you, know, you could walk into a pub and could, other people would think, oh my God. I remember Tom Power, poet, when we were in Dandam Freese, said he would never go into this pub because it was a bit of a rough place. And Duncan had said he'd meet him there. And he thought, oh my God. But as soon as he went in, he saw everybody was chattering away to Duncan as if they'd known him yesterday, you know. He had that amazing capacity, as you know, to say hello to everybody and anybody. And that was part of his, uh, part of his storytelling and charm. I mean, a lot of storytellers, I think, don't really understand that the most important thing is to say hello and be with people. And the storytelling is part of that. But I mean, uh, not to really warmly, happily love the people you're with and love the story. These two things are just what Duncan knew right from the toes up, you know? Yeah, as you know. Mm. Mm. And you know, when, yeah, when he used to sing in the van a lot, and uh, a lot of the time he'd sing. I remember, I remember when he was really getting very, very old, and I used to sort of think, my God, he knows uh, now the curtains are closing because he used to sing. Very often he used to sing, Oh, lonely I wander through scenes of my childhood that bring back sweet memories of happy scenes of yore. Oh, where are they now? All those scenes of my childhood, the young ones are scattered, the old ones are gone. There's no fire in the hearth, there's no light in the window, no light in the window, no welcome for me. So why stand I here like a ghost in the shadow? It's time to be moving. It's time to pass on. There's no fire in the heart. There's no light in the window. No light in the window no welcome for me. So why stand I here like a ghost in the shadow? It's time to be moving. It's time to pass on. You know, he used to sing that a lot and I used to think, yeah. And the other one he used to sing really yeah, near the end of his days was uh, the great whale, you know. And I do, uh, I do remember. Yeah. And it, but it was that thing of kind of his generation had had gone. There were not so many of his contemporaries around. Yes. Um, and I'm I'm quite pleased that he's missed these days now because oh, I think I mean, of all people, Duncan would have found being isolated, absolute purgatory. He just wouldn't have been able to cope with it. And yet, I mean, it's, I'm relying more and more, I think, on, on his stories. And I think one of the questions that I get asked a lot is, why are these old stories still relevant now? And there are people that maybe haven't heard a lot of stories and aren't familiar with storytelling that kind of have this thing of, why would you want, stories in this, you know, made up, make-believe, oldie worldy time? What, what relevance have they got to now? So what, why are you still telling Duncan stories? Why, why do you think that they're important now? Well, I think they're really important because, well, 
because they speak mind to mind, heart to heart, and they, because they carry really important a, emotional truths for the journey of the heart through life. And they, because they're a, in, the, in the kind of metaphor and a, a you know, emblem, they, they kind of, uh, they, they, they really speak in a way that everyone understands individually and they're not telling you this is what to think or this is the meaning. The meaning unfolds in this, you know, vivid, a metaphorical way in your own being and in your own experience. So, I mean, they wouldn't last and they wouldn't have lasted had it not been that inside them are these really incredible truths. And if you listen to them, they're kind of, um, to me, they're a kind of vicarious experience. So that when you tell people stories, that's why they remember them, because they believe they've been there. They really believe they've been there. So they've had the emotional journey. And it's, uh, there's so many things I think about that. I mean, it's why you really want to tell stories to children and why you want to be there rather than be on a screen because the relationship between you, I mean, this is what Duncan was so amazing at, and that them gives them safety and they can be scared stiff and delighted at the same time, but they've kind of been in, in these experiences and places. They, and whereas, you know, if you stick a kid in front of a screen and they uh, disappear and there's something frightening, you know, it's really very wounding. So I'm very, um, you know, very uh, glad to see that nowadays, alongside this unimaginable quantum leaps that technology is taking, there is also a huge kind of um, growing of storytelling. But I believe there's that hunger in people for the connection and the meaning that is in stories. I mean, you know, the other day, um, Tom Muir um, sent out some stories and he sent out one particular story that he says he loves very much. And uh, you could probably find Tom Muir telling. It's about 45 minutes and um, it's a, a really, it's just a fairy story in a way. So a farmer, three daughters, that along, with, along to the place one day comes a bear, a big, big bear said, I, want, I would like one of your daughters to come with me and be mine. And I'll give her, you, all the gold, all the money, all the riches you may ever want. Okay, so you think, here's a daft story about a, a bear, right? And so, in the end, the daughter, after a long time, one thing, agrees to go with the bear and goes to, it comes to an amazing place, a beautiful palace and all the rest of it. And uh, she's shown to a beautiful bed. And in, in the night time, a young man sleeps with her, but it's already, it's totally in the dark. And in the end, uh, she wants to go home, and the bear says, because in the morning, the, the bear is there. Uh, she never sees this young man. The morning she goes home, and uh, when she, uh, uh, her mother says, oh, a young man sleeps with you. You must see who it is. And of course, she um, sees who it is, and a bit, she drops a bit of wax on his chest when she's looking at him. When he's fast asleep, he's very beautiful. And he says, ah, oh, everything is lost. Now everything is lost. <clears throat> and in the morning, he's gone to marry this ugly, um, long-nosed troll. And uh, she is left to go on this ferociously difficult journey. She meets several different people. It's a very traditional story. She gets three different things and so forth. And in the end, she, uh, she um, a, of course, all turns out well. It's an amazing story, but to me, the interesting thing is that Tom, who, you know Tom Muir? Do you know Tom Muir? I don't know Tom Muir. I, I, I know the name, but I, I, I don't know him. He's a, he's, a, he's a wonderful man and a great storyteller. He's got a marvellous voice. 
But anyhow, Tom was really on the skids. His life was going to hell. He's a brilliant self-taught scholar, all these things, one thing or another, drinking too much and so forth. And then he met this woman, Rhonda. And Rhonda is an American. And she has been his complete redemption. And so the reason this story speaks to Tom <laughs> is that he's the bear, you know, it's quite clear that he is the bear. And this woman, you know, has made all these journeys over the seas, one thing or another. She, and now she is the one that is really a, puts his shoes on the road, one thing or another. She's like Lincoln, Linda was to Duncan, you know? And uh, so the reason it speaks to him, I don't know if he would articulate it, but I think people take to stories because they are speaking to them in ways that will unfold as time goes by, not like any that do this, do that, any of this sermon. So, I mean, the fairy stories are amazingly important. You know, one last thing about that, about the fairy stories. You know, a woman said to Einstein, I don't know if you know this, my son wishes to be a physicist. What should he read? And Einstein said, fairy stories. She said, well, after that, more fairy stories. And then, more fairy stories. You know? <laughs> so, you know, the things where things can shift and change as they do in physics, they're not what they look like. They're not at all what they look like. You know, who, who's, who's the beast, the beauty, or who's, you know? And the human beings are not like that. You can be with someone and they, you might think they're beautiful, and the next minute they're plotting, plotting to kill you, but you don't see it, you know? So, I mean, these invisible truths in fairy stories are, a, you know, very profound truths of our emotional journey through life. So I would always say, you know, fairy stories are forever. And, uh, and I don't really take much to people that think they can modernize them, of course. <laughs> That's another story. <laughs> Modernising them isn't my my favourite thing, I have to say, either. Well, we we are getting very close to the end of our hour, but we do have lots of, of people here who probably are burning with questions for you. So there is a little bit of time. Um, there is a, there's a Q&A button at the bottom, and there's also a chat box. So if anybody would like to put a question up in chat, or if they'd like to put a question on the Q&A, we do have a little bit of time um, to do that. And if you would like to put some questions to David. Um, and I just want to thank you again for the way that you have stepped in tonight. And yeah. um, after everything you've been saying about kind of it's much better to be there in person instead of on the screen and to take to this and to do it sort of just completely at the last minute. I really appreciate it and I think it's very brave and very wonderful. Now it's gonna, we've got to, um, so Robert Souter, uh, he was the one who was asking about how Dun Duncan felt about sharing his stories. Um, he's also asking, do you think there are any unique qualities to Scottish stories and Scottish storytellers? Something you would say are hallmarks or styles of the tradition? Well, I think if you listen to somebody like Tom Muir from Orkney and uh, somebody like Duncan, I, and many of these people, I think a hallmark is that they just talk to you. There's very little of, that, of this sort of big performance. I mean, I know uh, people like, um, you know, uh, what's his name in London, I keep forgetting, Ben, you know, the, these big performers are big performers. But I mean, we just, that's not the way the way is really as if you've you've got somebody in front of you and you say to them, right, I've got this wee story for you. And if you've got 400 people, you're still saying, I've got this wee story I want to give you. And so it's really the sense of ordinariness that cloaks the extraordinariness. I think one of the main features of Scottish storytelling. Yeah. Thank you. And Claire is saying, um, so Claire from Arizona, I was literally thinking of the minister in the school the other day. I wanted to hear it again and bingo, you told it. 
<laughs> that's what happens with stories. Sweet serendipity always attends. Um, oh, Carolyn, Carolyn started saying something. We've got half, half a bit. We'll wait for the other bit of the question. But it's interesting what you were saying as well um, about how we express things through stories and how towards the end you'd be sort of hearing Duncan and he would he would be singing a, a song like the, the Fields of My Childhood or The Last of the Great Whales. Yeah. And every time I went to go and see him, I'd say, oh, how, how are you, Duncan? How's it going? And he would say, oh, fine, fine, fine. And then he would sing a song or he would tell a story and then I would know how he, he how he really was, and yeah. and I know that's 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 my life. I I would find it quite difficult to tell people how I feel, or even to know myself. I have to, I have a story in my head, and that's the story that I might not be telling. Certainly, maybe wouldn't perform. I might tell it to friends, but it'd be the story that's that's walking alongside me. That's my guide. That's my companion for that bit of my life and I I don't really know how people who don't have that fund of of stories and those guides in their head manage to find a, a path through life really and that's definitely something that that I I shared with Duncan and that Duncan was very good he would do that thing like you were saying he would listen and listen and listen and people would be talking and talking and then through Kaylee and and he would just take that at the end he would hold on hold their hand to go I've got a song for you or I've got a story for you and it yeah. would be just what they needed to hear. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Are you going to be there all time? No, not much. <laughs> no, we're not going to be much longer. So we have been here for an hour. Thank you to all of us who've been our companions on the way. Um, it's been a delight having all of you, you here. Um, I've got a couple of announcements that I need to make. So the first is that this super whizzy Zoom that I'm still getting the hang of and working out all the best things that I need to do on with it. Um, it's been paid for by uh, Get A Word in Edways Festival. So, and, I'm going, and the reason they paid for it is because I'm going to be running concerts, spoken word concerts for them on the second Thursday of the month. So that means that this Thursday, seven o'clock, um, there will be a spoken word concert with lots of amazing people. We've got Nick Hennessy, who I talked to last week, coming back. We've got amazing poet Vicky McWinniers. Uh, we've got Sheila Arnold, fantastic um, African-American storyteller. Lots and lots of people. So there will be a programme going up tomorrow. Um, and come and join us at seven o'clock tomorrow. And on Friday... Um, Blast is back, so I run a, a storytelling performance club. Um, it usually takes place at Bishop's Castle Town Hall at eight o'clock on the second Friday of the month, and we normally stop for the summer. But given everything that's happening, we're starting that up again. We're having a summer season online, so you can buy tickets if you would like to hear Nick Hennessy telling um, The House of Skin on Friday. So we've got just two more questions and answers. Then we'll wrap it up. So Simon Hayward. I want to finish with, oh, yes. with one of Duncan's jokes. When I when the, you could do these questions first. I'll do these and then we'll finish. It would be great to finish on a joke. So Simon Hayward, I heard Duncan tell many stories, particularly towards the end of his life, but not so often heard him tell the longer tales, which I knew from his books. Did his repertoire change over the years? And maybe why did this happen? Um I think that's absolutely true. I think I think the longer stories, I mean, you, you'll have things to say about this as well as David, but I think telling the longer stories are tiring. Um, and to hold that space and to hold all of that, he did occasionally still tell them, but he wouldn't tell them in performance because to hold that whole world, that whole space for a number of people was, was just exhausting. And he would do it at home but even not so much and I think part of that was to do with his his health when he went on to Warfarin and had to stop drinking but what, what would you say David? Well I, yeah I think that's true and I mean the only time I ever heard him telling the flying horse of well I, I'd, I'd heard it once a long time ago a long time ago and I would always wanted to know that story and they we had a quarrel that lasted a year if you remember maybe uh, which you can do with Duncan and at the end of that, he came here and he said, David, I'm going to give you a present. And I'm going to, you've always wanted the Flying Horse of Elston. You can put on your recorder and I'll tell it to you. So he told it to me just as if he was talking to you. 
And that was the way he told it. And so that is one of my favorite stories, not only because it was this gift after a long quarrel, but uh, because it's such an amazing story. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. We were admiring the painting when you went to get a glass of water at the beginning. Um, it was great because we can see behind you, if you just lean to one side, you yes. have John Slavin's picture from the Flying Horse of Earth and behind you. Can, yes, yeah. yes. <laughs> it's a fabulous story. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so just, just before I get your joke, Mike's saying, did I say that the Spoken Word Club was on, on tomorrow? It is Thursday. I thought I'd said Thursday. It will be on Thursday, but I will put the programme up tomorrow so that you can see all the people that are going to be on. So we're going to wrap up, but how better than to finish with a joke. So take it away, David. Um, tell me the, your joke. Yeah. So his joke was that uh, this person was uh, in China and uh, he went to the doctor. He was very embarrassed. And, uh, he said, um, 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 I've got something wrong, Dr. Trump. Yes, yes, of course. You come to the doctor. He says, what is it? He says, well, it's... Um, um, what is it? It's my penis. Oh, let me see. And it was sheer black. Everything had gone black. Oh, the doctor said, very, very bad. Very bad. Chinese gonk. He says, Chinese gonk? What is that? What's the cure? He said, no cure. Cut it off. He said, no, 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 no. You can't cut it off. He said, well, go to see my, my brother. He is an expert on this, on this disease. Go to see him at the university. So he goes to the university. And uh, he said, I went to see your brother. And uh, he says, I got Chinese gonk. Oh, let me look. Oh, oh yes, Chinese gonk says, your brother says, um, you, you have to cut it off. He said, no, 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 my brother no nothing at all. No, no, no. One week it fall off by itself. <laughs> oh, <dear. laughs> very Duncan, very Duncan. Oh, yeah, very think... Duncan. Do you know, I thought we'd almost made it at the end and I thought we were going to get away without a penis joke. We had one last week. We've had one this week. All right. Oh, <laughs> no, dear, it may be coming a tradition. <laughs> Thank you very, very much. I really David. enjoyed it. You've been it, a beautiful guy. Thank you. It is always a pleasure to spend time in your company, David, and always a pleasure to hear you telling stories. And you were going to be one of the main featured um, guests this uh, this year at the Get A Word and Edgeways Festival. I think Mike is on, he's here listening. I might be jumping the gun, this is a, a bit of a secret. I'm not sure the official announcement has come out yet, but um, I can announce and ask you, David, if you will come to the festival in 2021, the festival is going to be postponed for 51 weeks. So it's going to take place the second weekend in July in 21 and Mike would still really love you to be one of the headliners. We're hoping that we can all get to see you in person and meet up and have stories and an exhibition of John Slavin paintings in July 21. As long, um, but as, I, as, long as I escape the as long as I escape the Chinese gonk and all that, that would be fine. Well, stay safe, yeah, stay sane, you. You and too. yes, and I hope. Hope you survive these troubled times intact and in good humour. Yeah, and thank yeah. you so much. And I, I will be here next week with another marvellous guest. I'm not quite sure who yet, but I'll be letting people know. Um, since you. my next next week's guest is here already. <laughs> so um, everybody is clapping you, David. Everybody is sending you love and applause and thanks. So please do read the, the chat. I'm going to... Um, I'm going to not end the meeting just for a little minute because I want to cut and paste the chat and make sure I see everybody's um, comments because I think I might have missed a couple. Uh, but this is the official end. Thank um, everybody for your attention and uh, their applause, which uh, I'll uh, in, uh, imagine. Thank you. <laughs>